Hello, welcome to this single malt review. This is in fact our first recording session for 2019. We've had some videos up already this year, but this is our first new content. We're starting off with a bit of a blast from the past. Yeah, starting off with something just a wee bit traditional yeah. over here. Um, you could say something incredibly traditional. It is, as you can probably already see, Cato's which doesn't strike me as a particularly Scottish name, but it was a particularly Scottish man, um, John Catto, or was it James Catto? It was one or the other, um, of Aberdeen. And 1861, for those of you who know their distilling sort of history, or their Scotch whiskey history anyway, um, distilling obviously around a lot longer than that, but the blending, the blending together of Scotch whiskey, that really only started arguably in the late 1850s. So this one pretty early to the party, and it doesn't directly make the claim that it's one of the oldest blends, possibly one of the older, I mean rather, the oldest blend commercially sort of uh, recognised, but it's, it is well, well, well up there, so uh, interesting. But there, in terms of the, um, the actual whisky, it's not that historic. It's a sort of a three to five year old blend, like a great many, but, but I liken it a wee bit to Cutty Sark in that it's a nice, honest green bottle, and the whiskey inside, though it's a wee bit deeper coloured than Cutty, it's not um, trying to imply that it's some sort of explosively sherry matured whiskey or anything like that. It's a pretty honest blend. Comes in a cool bottle too, you don't often see quartz yeah. in New Zealand, but this is a good old-fashioned quart, which is a, mm. um, that's a, that's a British quart as opposed to an American one. Yeah. You, you look that up. 1.14 litres, which is yeah, two pints in the old British measures, or 40 ounces for the Americans. Mm. And it's owned, owned by Interbev, which is one of these really big, sprawling multinationals that have all manner of brands under them, and uh, not all of them Scotch, not most of them Scotch for this one, so let me consult my yeah. official Ardbeg so notebook here. Are some of their single malt? Um, they own, old Pulteney, Anoch, Bolblair and Speyburn, so we can assume, we can assume that one of those, or possibly all four of them, makes up the malt proportion yeah. of what's in here. And whether we'll be able to... Truly excellent whiskey in that yeah. lineup, so... Um, neither of those are distilleries that I know particularly well, so uh, in terms of picking either of them up, I yeah. would be, wouldn't be supremely hopeful, but you, you never know. I believe there's lowland grain for the rest of the blend. Oh yes, well be, that'll be pretty, pretty stock standard, right. a big old whack of North British in there, <laughs> um, making up the majority of the whiskey, I suspect. But, um, as we don't need to say, coloured, chill filtered, take yeah. that as a given, so we won't spend a lot of time over the appearance, but, but... Could we nosy here? Hmm. I don't that's think that's too fresh bad. and grainy, yeah. a little bit wheaty. Um, the grain is very, very upfront, as it almost always is yeah. on these uh, no age statement blends, which, like I say, are usually hovering around the four to five years old yeah. average age, a wee bit on the other end, but um, especially the grain, that yeah, one's particularly quite old. prickly on the nose, despite only being 40%. Yeah, indeed. it's a wee bit fumy. It's summer here, yeah. um, which means it's probably winter for most people watching. I hope everyone's staying warm in America at the moment. They're in the middle of the uh, what they're calling the uh, the Arctic vortex, or whatever yeah, it is. Polar blast. It has gotten yeah. extremely cold in parts of the Midwest, so I hope everyone's... Um, Hope everyone's not relying on, um, well, I hope you've got something a bit more material than scotch keeping you warm over there in sort of Chicago at the moment, but I'm, I'm sure you are. Yeah, grain forward, not massively complex, but the malt is there, and it presents a pretty sort of fresh and fruity Speyside style. There is no peat in here, but none of those distilleries are particularly known for their peated malt. Old Pulteney might sort of dip a toe in that yeah. the end of the um, pool now and then, but Anok makes a oh, Anok peated offering. Does do a peated? They do um, flouter and uh, something. Picture of a rake. The peat, peat cutting tools range, yeah. but they are special releases. I would. Yeah. I can't imagine they find their way into blended whiskey. But anyway, anyway, enough beating about it. Let's taste it. Hmm. Oh, that is very beeswaxy up front. Yeah, there is a little waxy quality there. there. And yeah. I think of any of them, that's probably the Bol Blair coming through. Bol Blair has a very, a very, not quite up there like Klein Leash in terms of waxiness, but it does have a waxy, quite textural 
yeah. quality. And that does that does come through in the in the texture here. There's a little honey. Oh, a fair bit of spicy heat. A little cinnamon. Yeah. A touch of pepper. I get a wee bit of milk chocolate, um, some sort of fresh and free space sides, a lot of honey, sort of your standard space side you hear the honey quality there. And the rest really is grain, but it's not, you know, not horribly offensive grain. We have encountered some quite um, combative grains in very young blended scotch such as this. But this one, though, it's still, you know, it's pretty crunchy, uh, which is a word people don't like me describing because they, they don't like texture in their, in their whiskey descriptions. But crunchy is, I, I think of it in that grainy, grainy, gristy kind of flavour where you get sort of that wheat and that slightly sharp, slightly uh, more jagged notes from the... From the grain, just crunchy is how it, how I internally refer to it as. So if I say that, that's sort of what I mean. I was worried it was going to be perhaps a little watery being a blend mm. at this relatively low strength, but it's carrying itself quite well. It's a thin, light body, yeah. but not uh, too ephemeral. It's got enough heft to just uh, to marry nicely with the intensity it's, of those flavours. It's not too weak, that's for sure. I can say that though it doesn't really want any water, it will stand up perfectly well. Um, to an ice cube or two, so long as you don't let it linger in there too yeah, long. Be great on a warm day like today. Yeah, it is. It is not bad. Um, not bad summer drinking, as you can as you can see by the level of the yeah. bottle. Um, it does itself just fine as a longer longer drink. I imagine this would um, sort of blend nicely into a tall drink as well. Mm, Could if you were into that, sort of if you into that sort of thing, I think it would have. Um, well, this is more a, and I, I absolutely hate this drink, but. Um, for those of you who are into your whiskies and sodas, which sort of you hear about that in the you know back in the 18th century, but it is making sort of a comeback. Um, I don't know if it's sort of ironically or in a kind of a hipster way, like some things find their way back into the, um, the zeitgeist. But there are people out there who will, with a straight face, say yes, they enjoy whiskey and soda water. I am not one of them. I think it's abjectly foul. I think the, the combo between those two things doesn't work for me. I think they bring out Fizzy whiskey brings out the worst, the worst of it. But anyway, yeah. anyway, as an historical experiment, I did once try a uh, scotch and soda after encountering it in multiple Sherlock Holmes stories mm. of the late nineteenth, early twentieth century, as a sort of a pick me up for an adult client here and there. But no, I, no matter mm. what ratios I tried, it could not eat anything that tasted at all good out of that pairing. Yeah, any whiskey and soda fans, please, please explain in the comments um, what the. What the, what the point is, what the go is there, because uh, it escapes clearly both yes, of us. It's a flavoured soda to begin with. Yeah. But then. Um, the, one thing, the one thing I don't like about this is there is a slightly. Initially, that sweetness is quite good and welcoming, but it lingers. It lingers on the back of the palate. It does not go away. So it's got a long finish, but not one that does it any favours. It kind of has a, an almost an artificial sweetenery quality as it builds up. Yeah. There's um, not much to counterbalance that. It's just no. that one note the whole way through. And that means the more I drink of it, the less I want to drink of it, which is a problem if you're a whiskey that I'm supposed to be drinking. Um, I liken it to if you really have anything with a significant amount of spartamine or um, saccharin or other um, other artificial sweeteners, there's a particular way in which they hang about on the tongue. And there's a reason for that, because they um, all artificial sweeteners work by mimicking mimicking uh, real sugar insofar as the tongue, you know, the receptors on the tongue, um, are fooled into tasting something sweet or you know, very similar. But because they're not sugar, they're not metabolized into the bloodstream through the tongue. So they do actually sit there. They end up camping out on those sweet receptors and that's why you get that awful back of the throat, oh, I've had something artificially flavored um, character out of those things. And this, this does that to me, not implying that there's artificial sweeteners in here, which there absolutely is not, but just a similar experience on the tongue. Kind of doing the same thing, which I do not really appreciate. And that's, I think that's about as much as anyone needs to say about Cato's. So we'll move over to the scores. Um, I'll let you go first. I'm still cogitating yeah. on mine. Well, as I say, it's a fairly narrow band of flavours. It is a sweet, honeyed, and lightly spicy blend. It's a good blend. It's well balanced um, in terms of those sweet flavours. There's not much else to counterweight them. It's not. It's it's kind of a, a little bit one note, 
But then again, it did say one particularly nice note. There could be more in here. There isn't, but what is, is there is perfectly enjoyable, and it's a good use of the grain as well. It's not overloaded, not trying to bulk it out. Um, for me, it rates a round 77. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that's probably fair enough. It's a whiskey that's here to do a job, and that job is to get alcohol inside me in a fairly effortless um, sort of an exchange, and uh, though I'd really rather have it on ice, um, and typically do, yeah, it's fine. It's uh, probably a 76 for me. Nothing, nothing wrong with it, but I wouldn't really seek it out um, had I other options. Although, I should say, um, for a exceeding 1 litre bottle, for a 1.14 litre um, quantity of scotch, this was a profoundly small amount of money. So, um, a budget scotch, it well and truly is. This may, in fact, I know it beats Red Label, but a few things do these days. Um, it, it beats some really cheap blends. It beats some real um, infamously cheap um, Scotch blended whiskies out there. So it has that going for it, I suppose. If you're in there, um, if you're in the market of economy, which a great many of us are. So there you go, Cato's, possibly the most unscottishly named whisky out there, but it is at least pronounceable, um, unlike some others. So I guess uh, take of that what you will. Um, Sludger, we will get back down the mine now in this sort of new year of filming. Um, we've got some amazing things planned. Yes. Um, conceivably, conceivably, whiskies we've never looked at before. Mm. Stick around, it's going to be good, I hope.